All right, good afternoon. Try again. Good afternoon. Wake up. Yeah, there we go. I know it's day two, it's after lunch, it's a dark, quiet room. It's like, oh, it's a perfect nap time. I'll try to keep you awake a little bit. So who here has microservices in production today? Raise your hand. Huh? Decent amount, okay, keep your hand up if you're using a service mesh. Istio, Linkerd, Zool, okay. Well, I see you, not a lot. What about API management? Who's using API management tool platform today in production? Okay, and who's using both together in production? Well, not, okay, a, f a few enlightened ones, okay. We'll see if we can get everybody convinced that it's a, a good idea, they're complimentary. So we're gonna talk about API management and where it meets the service mesh. Um, as I kind of travel around and talk to a lot of people at conferences and customers, there's a lot of confusion, right? What, what's the difference? You know, if I'm using a service mesh, do I need API management tool? or vice versa, how does it help? Don't they do the same thing? Um, can I just deploy you know, a, an Nginx plugin and some microservices straight to production? Okay, so we'll see if we can answer some of those questions. So start with API management. Uh, it's a big topic, you know, we could probably spend an hour just covering the various pieces. It's pretty broad, you know, including things like API design, creation, testing, development portals, developer portals, uh, reporting, analytics, right, a lot of pieces, but today we're gonna focus mainly on the runtime aspects, what most people think of as kind of the API gateway side of things. So what's it give you? Well, primarily it gives you security, one consistent focused place, it's kind of the API firewall, the entry point from the internet to your stuff, right, where you can support OAuth and Jot and SAML and JWE and JWS and Jose and all the new specs from the consuming side, so callers can use whatever they want, but you only have to implement one bit of security on your backend APIs, let the, the management layer take care of translating. Same goes for mediation, transformation, so let me handle HTTPS and JMS and REST and SOAP and JSON and XML and all the various formats in that layer, so again, I only have to implement one flavor when I build the API and let the management layer take care of translating back and forth. Orchestration, so I can have you know, virtual endpoints and call maybe multiple services and stitch the results together, transform the data, hand that back to the caller. Traffic management, so I can direct incoming calls to the closest local implementation of the API. If it's you know, global apps, uh, multiple public clouds, global data centers, mix of on-prem, hybrid, wherever that is, you know, make sure I send it uh, to the closest um, implementation for better latency, better performance. Metering, quotas, all that kind of stuff can be in there. And then analytics, you know, operational metrics for the, the DevOps type people. Are we meeting SLAs? What is my throughput? What's my latency? Let me you know, drill down on problematic requests. As well as business analytics, how much money am I making from this thing? You know, I think we saw a couple talks yesterday, uh, BBVA and, and eBay, talking about the kind of things they measure. You know, those are important for the business to make sure you can keep getting funded. So if you have all that in place, then you can just focus on implementing your API. You don't have to deal with this, all these critical, necessary things that don't really add value to your functionality, right? Your API consumers don't really care about any of this stuff, you just have to do it. So outsource that, don't implement it again and again for every API you implement around the company. And Service Mesh does something very similar just on the internal side, on the implementation details side. Also has a security layer, why? Because you never want a hard crunchy outside with a soft chewy center when it comes to security, right? You want security in depth. So make it hard for the attackers. You know, authenticate, authorize, encrypt all your internal trans, uh, transmissions as well. You get traffic management, now this is a different kind of traffic management, this is more about um, canary deployments, rolling deployments, A-B testing, blue-green, you know, all those kind of uh, abilities to stay always on, have zero downtime while you're changing versions you know, across your microservices. Policy enforcement telemetry data, you know, collect all the calls and responses so you can debug. If you've got a lot of services, that can be challenging. And if you do this with a service mesh, 
they typically are implemented with these sidecars that deal with all the configuration, the networking, the security, all this stuff is done for you. So you just focus on writing the code. It's almost like a functionless, or a, a function as a service, serverless computing in a way, right? You just focus on implementing the function, let the layer, the service mesh do the rest. So API management, external focused, right? It's, it's the first line of defense from the outside world to you tends to be centralized, usually one or maybe a federated small number of them because you've got to have them audited by third parties, you've got to poke hole, holes in the firewall, right? You need to deal with uh, logging and policy enforcement and all the administrative details. So typically that's not very many in installations. Security is key and stability is key because if this goes down, all your APIs are down, right? So it's gotta be rock solid, reliable and scalable. Service mesh, on the other hand, has an internal focus. It's, it's really the, the implementation details of your API, right? So you tend to have a lot of them, maybe per geography, maybe per product family or product team or set of languages or platforms or frameworks you're using. You can have a bunch that can move fast, fail fast, experiment, right? Availability is key, so you have a lot of different uh, resilience patterns we'll talk about in a minute to keep up and running at scale, and it's about flexibility. Let the developers use the languages and platforms and frameworks they want, and those don't have to be the same. You know, especially if you've got, you know, we've got customers with over 10,000 developers around the world, they're not all gonna use the same stuff. There, there's gonna be lots of different pockets using different technologies, that's okay. And if, the, if you have these both in an environment, then the way it works is incoming calls to your APIs go through the API management layer, gets routed to your internal implementation, and the microservice does its thing. And of course, the APIs can call multiple microservices with orchestration, stitch the other results, transform data, and hand back the answer. All right, so that's the overall. Let's drill down a little bit. So API management side, it really is about being that firewall, that first line of defense. I think that's, that's a big part of it, right? It's the let's look at all the traffic coming in from the internet. You know, every hacker in the world who wants to attack your stuff has to go through this first. So you have one place to secure, lock down, audit, make sure you get it done right. It kind of defines the user experience, the customer, the developer experience, really, developers being customers now with APIs. Uh, the documentation, testing, all that gets presented by this layer. And what you get as a result, if you roll this out, and you do a good job of the implementation, you get consistent best practices. I think that's really important if you have, you know, if you have one API, and you've got five developers, you don't need this, right? If you've got tens, hundreds, thousands of developers in lots of different groups and geographies all moving at their own pace, right? You don't want to reinvent every one of these wheels with every new team or every API. You don't want to implement security. You don't want to implement, yes, we'll support uh, SOAP and JSON and XML and CSV and whatever the client wants to send us. Oh, and we have to handle JOT and JWT, JWE, JWS, Jose, right? We don't want to deal with all those different ways big customers want to use our stuff, right? We want to implement it once and let something else take care of the details. You don't want to have to enforce policies like guaranteeing you're going to enforce HTTPS or other encryption or malicious content and payload scanning or auditing or logging, all, you know, event processing. You don't want to do that again for every API. It's also good to have DevOps automation. How do you tie in your deployments to your CI CD system or your Spinnaker or whatever you might be using, right? You want APIs into your API management platform to do lifecycle, right? To do deployments, workflows, sign-offs, if you need regulatory compliance, all those kind of things. And finally, a good developer experience. How do you find the APIs that are available? Where's the documentation? How do you test it before you sign up? All that should be done consistently across every single API, every single team, without reinventing all the wheels every time. That's what you get out of a, a good system. So some examples, uh, and this applies to every industry, right? We've, we've heard lots of talks yesterday and today. Everybody's in software. Now everybody's doing APIs. I think AI eats APIs too. Everything eats the next thing. 
So in the financial, there's open banking, especially in Europe. It's an initiative where it's mandated by law. Banks have to open up APIs to the public, basically, to let them access their own data. We'll see as you do that. Now, again, all the, all the hackers have a great target. Sweet, you just open up these APIs that anybody can call. Let's see what I can do. So security is obviously key, as well as compliance. Uh, retail, uh, a lot of big Home Depot-like companies around the world now are, when you go to check out and you, you swipe your card, it's actually transacting by making API calls over the internet to the back end servers, right? Tens of thousands of these, of these things a minute in, in some cases. So you've got massive global availability needs. Um, a lot of legacy systems. You don't wanna rewrite all that code, you don't wanna start from scratch, so you need ways to put an API management type layer in front of all that legacy stuff so it can still use web services and SOAP and RPC and CORBA and everything else that's going on back there, but present you know, a modern REST JSON type interface. And that can still work. An industrial internet of things, another area where sometimes these big companies collect petabytes of data per day. Right? There's millions of sensors out there collecting data constantly. They want to collect the data, analyze it, aggregate it, package it up, and sell it to other partners and customers who want access to that data. That's all API-based. So massive scalability challenges, massive developer experience needs there. So API management is kind of uh, broadly applicable across all industries. So switching gears for a second to microservices and service mesh. So microservices, I think done right, and I think we just heard a little bit about that in the, the previous uh, presentation as well as yesterday. You know, our, our bounded context, independent data stores, you don't wanna reuse those, ideally, so you don't have to worry about schema upgrade conflicts and availability issues. Uh, it, it helps with agility, I think is kind of the net. Service mesh gives you this implementation fabric that lets you tie these together, again, without reinventing a lot of wheels. Gartner's calling kind of this future architecture, MASA, mesh app and service architecture, with the diagram there with the idea being that kind of the old school giant packaged applications, you know, the SAPs of the world and giant HR apps are kind of, be, they're, they're sort of going away. It's not one app anymore or one application. It's more of a facade. It's just access to a bunch of small apps that you might run on your phone. So for example, take a big HR app. Um, if you wanna request time off at work, you wanna wade through a bunch of menus in some big huge app or do you wanna go straight to the time off app on your phone, click three times and you're done, right? That's how people wanna consume tech now, small little bites. And those little bitty apps, those little bitty apps are gonna call services that are shared, reusable, and a lot of those are gonna call probably not shared microservices to get their work done. So now you have, um, I think I, we've heard again in the last couple of days, a lot of talks about you know, the complexity doesn't disappear, it gets moved. So now you've got a lot more moving parts, right? There's a lot of boxes and lines and arrows here to keep track of, and that's where service meshes, API management can help remove as much of the complexity as possible. Okay, so service mesh details. So if you've got your API management in place, you've got that API firewall to the public, right? So what's, what's coming in hopefully is good, safe, clean, normalized, ready to consume, right, on the internal side. You apply your security, et cetera. And you don't have to, but it certainly helps if you use something like Kubernetes, right, to manage all your containers and orchestration. You have a, a service mesh that deals with all networking and wiring all this stuff together. And so what you get then is, again, consistent best practices applied across all the microservices even across different teams and languages and platforms and frameworks, resilience patterns, you know, circuit breakers and bulkheads and retries and uh, exponential timeouts and all that kind of stuff baked in, all those reliability type things that help with availability and performance, you get sort of out of the box with the service mesh. Deployment patterns, so again, canary and AB and blue green and rolling deployments and which percentage of which traffic goes to the new version of the API, which one goes to the old one. Oh, the new one is not working, automatically roll back to the old one. All that kind of stuff is, can be done for you. You don't have to, again, do this manually. 
or every time you implement a microservice or every team doesn't have to do this. You do it once with the service mesh and you're done. Also consistent configuration. How do you wire up all the security and all the networking and all the telemetry gathering and all that stuff? Again, that should be kind of in a control plane that's then injected into your microservice, not implemented by hand. Reporting, visualization, again, can all come sort of for free. So on the service mesh side, open source is definitely leading the way. Um, I think I asked a raise of hand, so I'll, I'll ask again. This will prove it, see if uh, anybody's left awake. Who's using Istio today? No one. Or you're so tired you can't even raise your hand. Oh, we got one. <laughs> okay, who's using any service mesh except Istio? Got another one. A couple linker Ds maybe? Yeah? All right, mix. Usually when I ask and the crowd is awake, Istio is by far the, the number one answer. It can change over time, of course. They typically work with co-located sidecars, right, kind of injected into your container. All the networking security stuff is kind of done for you, and we'll look at a little bit of detail here. So to drill down just a bit, so I've got a couple services that I've implemented, A and B, and I want to have A call B, and I'm using Istio, right, this service mesh, then my service basically always just talks to local hosts. I don't have to worry about any networking, any configuration at all. It's very, very simple. I don't deal with security, authentication, encryption, none of that. The smart proxy that comes with the service mesh does all that for me, right? And that gets injected in the, into my container. So it gets configured by the control plane. These pieces of Istio called Pilot, Mixer, and Citadel deal with configuring all the proxies, getting all the networking figured out, dealing with the traffic management, right? What percent of traffic goes to the new version of your API, which to the old automatic failbacks, rolling deploys, AB, all that stuff done for you. Telemetry is gathered, right, and, and stored so you can visualize what's going on and track and trace. Encryption, what protocol should be used to talk? How do we encrypt it? How do we authenticate? Again, all that's done for you. You don't have to mess with any of it. So similarities between API management and uh, service mesh, they both need ways for developers to figure out what to do. Where, what are the services and APIs available? How do I find them? Where's the documentation? How do I test it? How do I deal with versioning and lifecycle and upgrades and workflows? DevOps, CI, CD integration, that's all needed. Monitoring, of course, usually it's microservices. Teams kind of do this their own way. Sometimes it's helpful if they're, they're shared. But in, in any way, you need metrics, visualization, alerts, all that good stuff. Some differences, again, API management tends to be external, service mesh internal, right? API management external, security is key. Internal is about availability. It's about always being on, making my services scale, do their thing. They tend to be decentralized on service meshes, so you can spread across all the teams and try different technologies. API management tends to be more centralized and heavyweight because of the auditing, regulatory compliance, you know, security lockdown type stuff. So how do they communicate? So from API management, typically hand off to service mesh. API management takes care of the authentication, authorization, scanning for malicious content, dealing with the global traffic management, metering, quotaing, all that stuff, payload augmentation. That's all done, redacting logs to blackout passwords. All that stuff can be done once via policies. You don't have to think about it again. Translates all the protocols, so you can have HTTPS APIs, but internally you're using message queues and Kafka and JMS and whatever, that's fine. JSON, SOAP, OAuth, SAML, or JAuth, whatever. All that stuff, again, can be done once. Then the service mesh takes over, does the discovery, handles the load balancing, encryption, traffic, encryption, traffic management, maybe event-based choreography to coordinate, to be very flexible. Your circuit breaker patterns, all that stuff is, is done. And then hands the result back to API management to then, again, maybe decrypt and re-encrypt, or go from your legacy protocols and formats, XML to JSON, your data transformations, hand it back to the original caller. And so when you have all that done, and it's done right, and it's implemented, and you have your API management, you have your service mesh, the result is you just focus on defining your API with your open API, Swagger, RAML, web service, whatever. Here's my inputs, here's my outputs. 
Okay, I've defined my public interface, now let me implement it with a microservice where I just say again, here's the input, the one format I accept, here's my output, I don't worry about anything else. These platforms take care of the rest. So conclusion, API management and service mesh address different needs, internal versus external, but they're both critical if you're using microservices. You can't have just one without the other. You're gonna have big holes to implement by hand. There's no one-size-fits-all solution today. For whatever reason, the, the commercial providers have focused on API management, and open source is focused on service mesh. So if you look at, uh, on the commercial side, things like Akana kind of focused on uh, big enterprise customers, heavy security needs, scalability. Like we talked, um, we heard yesterday, if you were in here for the eBay presentation, and they do $19 billion a year of uh, business revenue through their selling APIs. Uh, Akana has one hotel chain customer that does $80 billion a year through the API. Another customer does 13 terabytes a month of just API calls. So massive scalability, you know, name brand kind of companies. Uh, Apogee, another option owned by Google now, uh, if you don't mind Google knowing even more about what you do in your data. Uh, service mesh, again, very dominated by Istio. Linkerd, also a good option. Uh, Zool, kind of a lightweight proxy from uh, Netflix. Uh, but you need both if you're doing microservice. Is in production, you care about scale, security, policies, compliance, those kind of things. So hopefully everybody will leave knowing the difference and uh, hopefully not conflating them and realizing they are complementary, not competitive. All right, I think that's it. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Questions? <laughs> questions? Hi, this is uh, Sabri. Um, quick question about the management of software in general and how it relates to microservices. Um, I think our industry kind of sucks at retiring the software. We are very good at creating new stuff, right? I think we we'll all agree. So uh, w what are the tools or any advancements or futuristic you know, stuff coming down the pike which will help us in managing the microservices from EOL, end of life point of view. Is there anything going mm. on in that space? So th let me try to recap. So any, any kind of new technologies that help deal with uh, management of microservices, especially when it comes to end of lifing the, the services. Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> I think we heard a talk this morning um, about you know, HTTP headers that can kind of uh, say here's a, a sunsetted uh, basically API call. Yeah, that's one thing on the technical front. I think more importantly with microservices is kind of internal communication. And that's kind of a challenge. If you look at, if you think of things like uh, Conway's law, where you know the organizational structure tends to dictate what the technology structure looks like. If you don't buy into microservices at an executive, cultural, organizational level, um, it's gonna be kind of challenging to get right. If you do that and you wind up with small, you know, one or two pizza teams that, that communicate, you need to have, you know, special interest groups or architecture review board, some kind of team that kind of spans. So it's, uh, it's almost like the, the human message bus, right, where somebody can say this is end of life or we're sunsetting this and migrating to this. You need to notify the callers. Now, ideally you can gather that automatically through metrics, telemetry, logging to know who's calling those services and, and automatically reach out to contact points associated with those services to say, look, you've got to migrate off, this is going away. Um, but because the humans are involved, you know, communication is always tricky. I don't know if technology can completely solve that one. Uh, any other questions? We have maybe time for one, one more. One more question. How do you evaluate the ORI? How do you evaluate how do you, the... How do you sell this kind of a system? Let's say you're looking at all of these different products. Somebody's committed to microservices. Yeah. But they want to look at uh, what's it worth. Okay. So, so how do you, basically, how do you prove ROI to your senior management so they'll let you spend money on stuff? To a client. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah, or a client. 
Um, if you've got a mission critical type app, right, where you, if you have the ability to collect reporting data analysis and you have the business metrics, like we talked about collecting how much revenue is going through a system, it's a lot easier to prove to management, look, we're doing a million dollars, a billion dollars, whatever it is, through APIs and these new channels that you're trying to expand into with digital transformation. If this goes down, you're gonna lose X dollars a day. That's a pretty convincing argument to a lot of CFOs. Um, if you don't have that data, it's a lot trickier to, to prove. So you gotta, step one, get the data to prove the case, I think. All right, Freda, I think I'm out of time. If you have any questions, um, I'll be around after. All right, thanks. Thank you, Rod.